Hello and welcome to the Radiate Wellness Podcast with your host, metaphysician, Reiki master, and hypnotherapist, Christy Clemens Hoffman. Each week, we will discover teachings, tips, and tools to radiate your best life ever with practitioners, authors, and luminaries to help you on your path. Wellness, joy, peace, abundance. What do you want to radiate? Hello and welcome back to the Radiate Wellness Podcast. Today we radiate insight with Franz Stina, uh, who is the author of The Way of Reiki, The Inner Teachings of Mikau Usui. Now being a, a Reiki master of the Usui tradition myself, I was really interested to do this interview. And um, I'm just happy to have you here. So welcome, Franz. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Really excited about it. Yeah, that's fun. Um, so you're in the Netherlands currently, in, outside of Amsterdam, and you have been influenced by um, this Japanese system of healing, otherwise known as Reiki. How did you discover Reiki? Oh, that's a long story. But <laughs> I'm, I'm, but I keep it short. So 50, I'm 56. So when I was 30, I didn't feel that well. And I was living in India at that time. I lived there for two years. And so I had a interesting experience there through a local healer in the Himalayas. And then after that, I started to buy different books. And one book was a Reiki book and started to hands on healing on myself from that book. And I thought, well, this is quite interesting. And then I met a Reiki teacher in Nepal, Kathmandu, started to do teachings there. And, and um, yeah, from that on, actually, it really intrigued me so that I wanted to rediscover how it actually was taught to Japan. And so in 2001 was the first time I went to Japan to investigate the more traditional teachings. Wow. You know, of course, by the time that many of us have found Reiki and have, you know, taken our training in it, we are long down that that tradition. So what did you find out about Usui that you were surprised about, perhaps? Well, I mean, one of the first thing I think now when we say the word Reiki, we think about hands on healing or sometimes, you know, people who have no idea, they say, oh, so is it a kind of a massage? But traditionally, it was actually uh, a a practice for self-awakening. Right. Right. And was that something that you discovered in taking a deeper dive into Usui's teachings? Yeah, and what was really interesting that when we uh, first went to Japan and then I started to investigate also and look at the symbols and mantras within the system and some of these practices, you started to really see that Mikasui borrowed it from esoteric Japanese spiritual teachings like Zen, Buddhist teaching, Shugendo, Shintoism, and really for self-awakening later on it become more and more a hands-on healing method specifically when the system moved to the west so for me it, it was really good to go back to japan because for me ultimately and this is my personal journey that to help someone Ultimately, we first need to make sure that we're very, very clear and pure ourselves. in a way. Of course, doesn't mean we have no issues at all, but that, you know, even if we can see ourselves as a channel, then the channel has to be purified. It has to be clear. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. And I, I, for that, I really love the Reiki principles. Is that something that you had uh, taken a deeper dive in as well? Yeah, you can see them behind me in Japanese. And oh! The, yeah, so uh, I love them. And for me, they are kind of the, the foundation. And if we, again, look at them, it doesn't talk about hands-on healing at all, but it talks about a mindset of no anger, no worry, being grateful, being true to our way in our being and being compassionate. And ultimately, it's a state of mind. And this state of mind is so needed in the world these days. 
Yes, for those who are not familiar with the Reiki principles, they are just for today, I will not be angry. Just for today, I will not worry. Just for today, I will be grateful. Just for today, I will do my work honestly. Just for today, I will be kind to every living thing. A good way to live our lives. Absolutely, yeah. Not easy, as we all know. <laughs> right. But if we think of it as, okay, well, just today, this is going to be my goal. Just for today, I'm yeah. going to do this. Because when we think of, uh, you know, making this huge lifelong change, that can be a little intimidating. So do you think that's why Usui wrote it that way? It's a very common, the word today actually is very commonly used in a lot of these Japanese spiritual teachings in Zen, or I, I work with a teacher for myself, and he is in a Shugendo Tendai Shinkon tradition. And they also say, you know, today, or uh, all what we're doing today at this moment, uh, and that is really taking that pressure off. And also, you know, most of the time we think about the future or the past and really bringing that mind back into our body in the present moment, so to speak. Mm, right, right. So it's just, in, again, with kind of these Zen ideas of maybe impermanence and, you know, modability that just, just for now, this is what I'm doing just for now because everything is so temporary. So, so did it, you, it yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you learn Japanese? No, I'm really, I'm, I'm terrible with Japanese, but I'm very lucky that this particular teacher, he speaks English. So yeah. Good. Is that where you took your Reiki training was in Japan? Uh, no, I went here first in 2001. I started with uh, first a uh, different Japanese Reiki teacher. And then in 2003, I trained with another one, met up with some other Reiki teachers. And still, I wasn't still satisfied what I was looking for. I was really looking for a uh, quite a more deep spiritual path. And in 2012, I met a priest and... Um, He's really teaching me also where Mikasui was taking these teachings from. So where did he took these symbols from? What do these phrases really mean from these Japanese spiritual traditions like the Reiki three symbol and mantra daikomyo, for example? What does it mean? How, how, how does it relate, as you say, emptiness or that non-duality as in Zen? very similar so yeah that is uh really helped me to get a much deeper understanding and that is one of the reasons i wrote uh, the way of reiki the inner teachings of mikasui so mikasui where did he get these symbols and these principles then well i mean we should not forget i mean the story is that he was sitting on mount karama uh, for 21 days and these meditation practices are still done. I mean, he wasn't camping and having a little holiday for 21 days. And this is uh, actually you, you probably practice for 20 hours a day. You sleep only for three, four hours a night. And you sit on this mountaintop to really have a direct experience, what they call between brackets of dying. It's not the physical death, but it's the death of the ego. Mm -hmm. And when we let go of that, then, of course, that great luminosity comes forward. And what is really interesting that these 21 day training, Mount Karama at the time of Mikasu was a Tendai Buddhist training ground. And in the 1940s, that changed. But in Mikasui's time, it was a Tendai Buddhist training ground. And before you can do this 21 day training, you have to have done the seven day training before that you have to do the three day training and before that you have to actually have been practicing for a long time so by mikasui already acknowledging and seeing that he was doing this 21 day training on mount karama what was at tendai at that time it means that he was borrowing a lot from these esoteric japanese spiritual teachings and so we can for example see in Reiki 2, there is one particular symbol, we call that a distance healing symbol. But if we look at it, it's a Japanese phrase. And that actually phrase has really links to 
these esoteric teachings, or if we look at one of the the second symbol, for example, we can see also that it's used in a lot of these esoteric teachings. Mm-hmm. And Mikasui not simplified it, but what he was trying to do, which was very common at that time in Japan, was kind of create a system what was and could be used for lay people so that you didn't have to be a monk or a nun and you still could really lay bare that beautiful luminosity of love and compassion and kindness. And it was very popular at that time uh, to to simplify and make these very old Japanese traditions more accessible for the common person. Right, right. I mean, it is very accessible for the common person. You do not yeah. need to have any type of particular background to learn to harness the power of Reiki energy. Absolutely. And so what what can a, a Reiki practitioner get out of this book? Um, I think really it's that fine tuning. For me, this book is also, uh, I wrote it during COVID. So oh, of course. <laughs> I normally I travel a lot. And so two years of not traveling a lot. And so it was really also a good time for me to fine tune my own practice. And so therefore, this book is really about even if you're a practitioner or Reiki master teacher, fine tuning your practice. And therefore, the more we fine tune it, hopefully we get more out of it. And we can therefore also understand more where Mikasui borrowed these teachings from, from these different traditions. And when we when we see that, then we gain a much clearer understanding of the whole system as a whole. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So you see Reiki clients currently? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Actually, I was doing a few sessions today. And so mm-hmm. I do hands on healing on people. I also do one on one sessions where I teach or train. I teach Reiki one, two and three classes. I do Reiki retreats. Um, I travel all around the world doing that. Oh, fun. Um, and then so if someone is not versed in Reiki is not a practitioner, what might they get out of this book? Well, it's interesting that you asked because uh, someone actually contacted me the other day and had bought, uh, it's just out my book and had bought it and sees from Spain and said, oh, I, I don't know anything about Reiki. And somehow I, I bought your book and she said, oh, by just reading it, I feel already uh, more calmer. There's also some meditation practices within the book. I feel more calmer, more relaxed, more open. Uh, can I come and do a Reiki one class? So it's it's wonderful to also see that people who have not really practiced the system of Reiki or maybe they're meditators or Tai Chi or yoga or Qigong, that they can benefit from it. Right. Yes. Yes. I understand. Um, so you're, you currently are a Reiki practitioner, but you also t- a Reiki teacher. Yes. Uh, when did you start teaching Reiki? I started to teach Reiki actually really in uh, 1999, 2000. So I've been teaching now for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. We actually first had a Reiki center in Darjeeling, India for a year where I was doing a lot of volunteer work and I was mainly teaching Mm -hmm. as a volunteer basis for the local community for a year. And then when I started to do more research also about the system of Reiki, I co-wrote a book called the Reiki Source Book, and that became quite popular. And then I started to travel around the world, and the rest is history, so to say. (laughs) Right. You certainly live, breathe, and just practice all of these teachings so easily. Now, what other types of teachings did you learn along the way? Um, well, you know, what is interesting, I trained with a Taoist teacher yeah. uh, for about 12 years. Unfortunately, she passed away. And for me, she was, I I'm, don't call often people a master, but for me, she was a real master. She was brought up in a 
uh, Taoist community in China was when she already was three years old. So her attainment and the way she was teaching was absolutely stunning. And then since 2012, I've been working with this priest in Japan who not only teach me the background of the system of Reiki, but also more esoteric practices where we can see the system of Reiki is kind of almost say the mother of the system of Reiki, if I can say it that way. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah, um, you certainly are the, the consummate teacher of Reiki um, and practitioner, of course. But if you were to go back to when you first started teaching Reiki, what would you advise yourself? What would you tell yourself? Uh, really to make sure that you have a very direct experience of this as much as we can of that we are Reiki. It's not something outside of us, but that we are really that Reiki within us, that, that great bright light, that luminosity, because then the teaching starts to flow more and more easily. And therefore, also, the more we feel like that light, the less we have attachment to things, what happened maybe in your class or when you do hands-on healing on people. I always say it's easy to do hands-on healing. Of course, it's not that easy, but we can put our hands on someone or we can teach, but to deal with your clients and your Right. Uh, your student is is a whole different ball game. People come, you know. With I, I first went to the system of Reiki because I wasn't feeling well physically and emotionally. So we have to also learn how to deal with that. We do. You know, your comment about hands on healing, I think, is is a is a good one. I mean, because it is easy. Because I feel like it is very natural. I'm a mother, and you know we know all know that mothers and parents naturally put their hands on their children, like rub their back, pat their, pat their arm. And it really does feel better just, and even on ourselves, like, Oh my goodness, I have a headache. We put our hands on our temples. We have a stomach ache. I put my hands on my stomach. Oh, something's hurt my heart. I put my hands on my heart. It's very natural and easy. Um, but Reiki energy of course is different. How would you explain Reiki energy? Um, I don't really see it as something different. I see it more as that, yes, we, we already have that quality of doing it, except mm -hmm. uh, I see it a little bit like when we have a lampshade and that light is on and due to our anger and worry and frustration, like when we look at the precepts, we put all these layers over the top. And so the light kind of we use uh, before we do training, most of the time is obscured due to these lampshades. And when we practice in the system of Reiki, our, our true nature, our true self, that essence what we are becomes more and more luminous, so to speak. Like, uh, the the first time I was uh, living in Darjeeling, I met up with this uh, Tibetan young man, 21, and I was just learned a system of Reiki. So it was all very new for me. And so he goes, um, we became friends. And he said, so Franz, so what is Reiki exactly? He said, well, you know, for me at that time, it was more hands-on healing. So, you know, it's going with the hands like that. And then he goes, oh, like this. And he puts his hand towards me. And the quality, the state of mind, what triggered within me, the, the flow of energy, what it triggered within me was astonishing. I was like mind blowing. And he, he just went like this brief, very brief. And I go, I want what you have. <laughs> and then he was telling me that he just came out of a cave, has been meditating for three years with his teacher in this cave. So, of course, the the light what emanated from him was very, very different than the light what emanates from someone who's got a lot of worry and fear and anger and attachment to all sorts of different outcomes, for example, in a treatment. Oh, my goodness. You know, you're, you're 
your story of this young man and his this wonderful energy that comes out, I can really feel it over the Zoom, over the airwaves, this wonderful energy coming from you. And, you know, there is a, a difference in the quality of people's energy that we can absolutely. feel. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now, the the how of how we practice Reiki, why is that important? Now, doesn't the energy just know what to do, being very intelligent? Uh, yes and no. But even, for example, say say we even feel that we are a conduit, right? Or, right. Um, then imagine that I have a, a glass with a straw, and the straw is the conduit for the water. So if the straw is dirty, then the water I drink is also contaminated by what is stuck in the straw. If the straw has a knot in it, then I can only get a little bit of the water. If the straw has a bent in it or a crack in it, then again. So even if we think we are a conduit for this Reiki, then we have to make sure that the conduit is strong, is clear, has no crack in it, no knot in it. And then so we can ask ourselves, what are those knots or cracks? Well, that's attachments, fears, worries, anxiety. For example, uh, as soon as I do a treatment on someone, some people already have a very big investment in it. Like, oh, I hope the person feels something. I hope they get better. Uh, so hope, of course, is wonderful. But when I hold it too tight and then my client doesn't feel better, or still has an illness and they said, well, I, I didn't really like this treatment or I'm still feel I have a cold. Then as a practitioner, we might feel insecure, worried, oh, I'm not good enough. And then the whole ball starts to roll. So therefore, ultimately, it's really about letting go of the eye. Say more about that. Letting go so, of the eye. The eye, because uh, normally, you know, like we also have it very much. Oh, I'm a healer. I want to fix you. Uh, yeah. I, I, I hope you're getting better. I hope you enjoy the treatment. So the eye is often one of those lampshades covering up this light. And um, so we can also, again, look at the pre precepts, for example, uh, anger and worried and we can say who is getting angry i am getting angry who is getting worried i am getting worried so therefore if we let go of the i then who is there to get worried who is there to get angry and then we can really feel that luminosity of compassion coming forward did you know that radiate wellness is more than just a podcast that's right we're also a comprehensive holistic wellness practice. Find out about our services, practitioners, and upcoming events at radiatewellnesscommunity.com. While you're there, visit our podcast page to read more about our great guests and even donate to the podcast. If you like our podcast, you can help in other ways as well, like subscribe or follow us wherever you're listening right now. Tell a friend, a family member, or a coworker about the great content you find here. And if you wouldn't mind, please give us a thumbs up, a five-star rating, or a positive review. Sounds like a small thing, but it really helps. You might like to know about our Facebook communities while we're at it. We have a free community, the Radiate Wellness Community, on Facebook for news and great free content. Our subscribers group is Radiate You, as in the letter U, but also, well, you. There you'll find curated replays of past classes, guest interviews, and more. And now, back to our podcast and back to our guest. I totally get it. And I like your analogy of the, of the straw and of the lampshade because, yes, that can greatly greatly affect the flow of raking the purity of raking the transfer yes getting that ego mind out of the way and just is stepping aside just the i being stepping aside and getting out of the way 
Yeah, I love that. I love that. Now, there are many Reiki books out there. Uh, I've read several of them. And what makes the way of Reiki different? Uh, I think it's a very unique book. And one of the reasons is that it doesn't look necessarily about specific hand positions or stuff, but it's really look at, at the finer essence of it. Uh, the the really kind of nuances of how to really clarify how we practice, the way we practice. And then, of course, the, the more we fine tune all of that, the, the more we get out of it. So it's the same. I always use the same analogy uh, or example as cooking. I can quickly throw a few veggies and things in a pot and cook it of course it's still food but it might not really taste that well but if i fine tune my cooking then it tastes better it's more nutritious so therefore i get more out of it okay right of course that makes sense that makes lots of sense okay um so what one thing would you hope that people get out of this book the way of reiki uh, a deepening of their practice, more insight, and more insight that we actually can slowly lay bare our, our compassion, our kindness. Because for me, hands on healing is great, but it's a little bit limited. You know, I cannot walk in the street and do hands on healing on everybody I come across, uh, but I can be kind and compassionate to everybody I come across. So, that in itself is already healing. You know, if I kind to someone in the street, if I'm a little bit more kinder to someone in the supermarket or at my work or in the apartment building where I'm living, then that in itself already can trigger a lot of healing. We all know that if someone, if, if you're not feeling that well and someone comes up to you and says, hey, you're okay, can I help you? Or, wow, nice jacket you're wearing today, or, I don't know. The other day I was at a cafe, it was noon, and the lady comes over and I said, I said, oh, how are you today? I said, I'm fine. I said, but how are you today? How has your day been? And her mouth dropped open and she goes, you're the first client who asked me that. And I said, I've been working here since seven. And so afterwards she said, oh, thank you for being so kind to me. And you could see her whole body, her whole energy, her whole mind becoming more joyful and, and open. And that for me is, you know, a much more uh, way of healing in a much more grander way than hands on healing, because not everybody wants their hands on themselves or right. on someone else. Yeah. Or on somebody, or, or have someone else's hands on them, yeah. right? And no, you're absolutely right. It costs absolutely nothing to give a smile and a kind remark. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's quite natural and and easy. It feels so good for the recipient and for us too. Well, it's a wonderful story this afternoon. I get a my neighbor text and said, France, are you home? I said, yeah, I'm, but I'm doing some work. I said, oh, don't worry then. And the way she texts, I could already hear it. She wanted to do have a coffee. And so she comes over. She wasn't feeling that well. She doesn't like hands-on healing or Reiki per se. So we have a little coffee as much as possible. I go into this interconnected state of kindness and love. And after about 20 minutes, you say, oh, I feel much better. Thank you, Franz. See you, see you later. And so no hands-on healing has taken place and yet she feels better. Oh, that's wonderful. So when you have these interactions with people, do you turn on your Reiki before you do that? Uh, well, I, I don't really, this is, this is also for me a very big difference. So in the beginning, we really feel that we need to turn it on. And that is a little bit, again, let me use the example of a light again. It's like we turn on the light, right? Click. And then later on in the beginning, it might even first feel like a dimmer, right? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, there's the light and now it's bright and now it's bright. Oh, now it's like full. Mm -hmm. And then later on through practice more and more and more, 
we actually realize that that light is always turned on 24 hours a day. It's just that we, due to our habitual patterns, don't realize it. Like, for example, uh, I live in an apartment building and big windows. It's now dark outside. It's almost 6 p.m. in the evening. And I might say the sun is not shining, but that is, of course, not true, right? If I go beyond the darkness, the sun is still, I, is no one is clicking the sun off and out in Holland and then clicks it on in the US or Australia. Do you know what I mean? The sun is always there. And when we look again within the system of Reiki, we see, uh, for example, in one of the symbols and mantras, we see a very clear pointing out to the sun and the moon. And so it's indicating that we're already this light. This light is always burning, but it's just due to our habitual patterns that we say, oh, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm unhappy. I'm stressed. I'm depressed. I have a burnout, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. So it's always there. Sometimes we just don't recognize it. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. No, absolutely. And, um, so, so your book, The Way of Reiki, is it for practitioners of all levels? All levels, beginners, people who already have been teaching. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I wrote it specifically that everybody can read it. Everybody can get something out of it. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's, uh, I've been doing this now for almost 25 years so it's uh this book because i've written some more books before that but uh, it's really a, an accumulation of where i am now within my practice so even you know people have been teaching for a shorter period they might and hopefully they gain some insights from it i actually do teach a lot of existing reiki teachers who wants to deepen their own personal practice or become better teachers. Yeah. You've certainly written several books, many books on Reiki. So there is, in addition to the way of Reiki, the inner teachings of Mikao Sui, you wrote the inner heart, rediscovering your true self, the inner heart of Reiki. I'm sorry. The inner heart of Reiki, rediscovering your true self, Reiki insights, and then you've co-authored the Reiki source book, The Japanese Art of Reiki, A to Z of Reiki Pocketbook, and Your Reiki Treatment. So much, um, so much information out there. Why did you feel it was necessary to write The Way of Reiki? What, what more are you bringing to your Reiki writings? Um, well, I actually, I, my style of writing is not that I go like, okay, now I want to write a book for other people. The first point of call for myself is always writing for myself. So I write it for myself so that I can be a better teacher, that it's clearer. Uh, so when I write, I kind of know then it becomes easier for me to formulate when I'm teaching and I teach a lot all through the world or online. So, and then I go, Oh, actually this would make a perfect book. (laughs) So it's a, it's a different way. And as I said, uh, it's, I can see, for example, of the three books I've written, uh, the inner heart of Reiki, rediscovering your true self and then Reiki insight. And then the way of Reiki, the inner teachings of Mikasui, is uh it's almost like a progression it's like slowly going deeper and deeper into the practice right so did you intend to, to did you set out with the intention to write a book about the founder of usui reiki um not really it's uh again for me is is really about how these practices were used within Japan, how when we look at the structure of uh, what we know Mikusu was teaching, what it actually means, what it stands for, what it's trying to point out, and and that became the way of Reiki. So yeah, it was uh, it was not really in my in my planning. I'm not so much like a writer like that. 
So it, uh, right. it's something what kind of percolates and then I really need to sit down and then I write almost like 12 hours a day. And um, yeah. Right. Wow. So what is, what is next? Do you have any other books in the works or just ideas? I'm not sure yet. I, I would like to do a painting. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And um, you've, you've had so many different experiences. You've experienced Reiki in Japan and in India, all over the, all over the world, basically. Do you notice a difference in the teachings, the style or the practice of Reiki across these different cultures? Uh, you know what was really interesting when I lived in India and uh, we used to go to these uh, villages in the tea plantations and we would be picked up by a car with a translator and a driver who would take us to the villages on the tea plantations where people were sick mm. and no questions were asked. Of course, they didn't, never had heard of Reiki, but you would come in this little house or a hut and there was a sick person laying down no questions asked they were just like yeah whatever you want to do is fine and so because they were used to people doing some form of healing for them and and we are not that used anymore like for example i went to a massage uh, for a massage two days ago and a massage therapist uh, again she asked me franz I go there often, uh, what can I do for you? I said, as usual, I've got no specific issue, uh, but normally we go for a massage or for a healing when we are pain or we, we don't feel good, but in a way that's a little bit too late, right? It's We need to make sure that we stay healthy and then we get less sick. So I go for a massage or acupuncture or Reiki sessions on a regular basis for myself to make sure my energy, my mind, my body stays healthy and therefore hopefully less sickness. And I could really see that in some of those more Asian countries that it's a more uh, preventative than in a lot more modern countries where we say, oh, I only go to do these things when I'm sick. Mm, I see. And, then, and then we're better and then we don't do it anymore. <laughs> and then we get sick again. So yeah, it's a little bit an interesting uh, concept to think about. Of course. So you have, you actually seek out Reiki treatment yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I love Reiki treatments. I love acupuncture. I go for massage. Actually, I have a massage again tomorrow, because for me, it's uh, it's like eating good food. You know, I need to look after this body, after my mind, after my energy, so that uh, it stays clear. You know, it's not just. Uh, Every day we accumulate stuff. Maybe, you know, we watch something on television or someone says something or I eat something or so therefore we all know, you know, we brush our teeth, hopefully two times a day, maybe more. And we wash ourselves and, you know, we might do a little bit of exercise, but then also we often forget that on a daily basis, we also need to clean, like brushing our teeth, our mind and our energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Um, yeah. So is there anything left that you feel like we haven't talked about that you think is important for people to know about this book, The Way of Reiki, The Inner Teachings of, teachings of Mikao Usui? Um, anything else you would add? Uh, go and read it. And then if you like, you know, find a good teacher in your neighborhood uh, who can really help you. I mean, reading a book is fantastic, but it's like reading a cookbook. It doesn't solve my problem of eating. I need to cook it and then I need to eat it. So, yeah, if you enjoy it, go and find a good teacher in your local area and then practice. Most important really is uh, is practice. Yeah, absolutely. And where can people find this book? 
Amazon, uh, all good online resources. Uh, you can also buy it in good bookstores still around the country, around the world. Yes. Yes. Okay. This and all of the other great books that you have written. Well, thank you so much for sitting to talk with me today, Franz. It's really been a pleasure. Wonderful. Well, thank you for inviting me. Happy to do so. Radiate Wellness is an international community of holistic and alternative healers dedicated to helping you create spiritual, energetic, and physical well-being. To learn more about our practitioners, services, classes, and events, or to schedule an appointment, visit us at radiatewellnesscommunity.com.